Hello everyone. Uh, the World Malaria Report 2021 by the World Health Organization sees India as the only high burden country to have been able to sustain a reduction uh, in the malaria disease uh, burden. Uh, and and as we discuss the issues around the the uh, World Malaria Day, uh, which again puts the disease in in back in focus and the need to deal with it and to perhaps contain it. Uh, uh, it's important that we look in terms of what uh, various studies have looked at. The WHO study, for example, talks about uh, uh, notes that India accounts for about 82% of world of the malaria deaths in the Southeast Asian region. Uh, the pandemic months have, of course, added to the woes and and has not helped really. But now there are newer technologies being talked about, and there are there are various text and technology tools also being discussed. So what are the options and challenges before various countries, including India? Uh, we have with us here, uh, Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, uh, chief scientist at the World Health Organization, and one who has looked at these developments closely and understands not just the scenario globally, but India very closely. Thank you so much, doctor, for your time. It's really very useful, very nice that you've been able to speak to us on an important subject that has been close to your heart as well. So, Doctor, if I could begin with your thoughts on how the pandemic months have reversed the, the whole journey towards uh, malaria eradication, if you could begin with your thoughts on that. Sure. Thank you very much, first of all, for shining the spotlight on malaria. I think it's um, important that even as the people's attention is most of the time on COVID, uh, we need to make sure that many of the other endemic diseases that still continue to take a lot of lives and cause a lot of suffering and misery, uh, do not lose our attention. So World Malaria Day gives us an opportunity to uh, look a little bit back and also into the future. Um, as you mentioned, India has done well. And the last year before the pandemic, 2019-20, did see a reduction in the malaria uh, incidence. But we still have a very high burden, particularly in the Southeast Asia region. Of course, we are uh, number one in terms of cases. India is number one because of the population. Uh, we've learned a lot from the pandemic, and I think we can leverage some of those uh, learnings for malaria, for TB, and for other disease programs. Firstly, I think we've learned about the importance of surveillance. And I think if we invest in a sort of integrated surveillance system, in terms of, uh, let's say, all vector-borne diseases, having one integrated platform, and go beyond just malaria cases and deaths, but also look at the uh, genomics, uh, this will help us also to monitor the resistance of the malaria parasite to the drugs that are being used. And I think it's uh, important that we continue to monitor that. We also have to uh, continue to focus on the vector the mosquito, because uh, clearly vector control interventions have also advanced a lot and there have been a lot of innovations in, um, uh, we don't have only the older applications like the index, uh, you know, the spraying of the indoor, uh, indoor, indoor residual spraying, but we now have insecticide treat, treated bed nets. And we also have other devices now, which can be used to attract uh, and kill mosquitoes. And we need to continue to do more research and development in India. Uh, I think we still import uh, insect insecticide treated bed nets. So it is high time that we actually started manufacturing some of these in India. And also we need to monitor the resistance of the mosquito to these insecticides. And there is a shortage of entomologists in the country, particularly field uh, public health entomologists. And we need to continue to train such people and deploy them in the field because many diseases today are spread by mosquitoes, different species of mosquitoes, and uh, including dengue and Zika and malaria, and they all need interventions based on the knowledge of the vectors, which, by the way, keep on adapting and changing. We've also learned from the pandemic how to use digital platforms, both for training, capacity building, but also for monitoring and for providing care to people who may be you know, in the periphery or at remote distances. Um, so, we, you know, we depend a lot on ASHAs to provide the last uh, mile coverage in terms of performing the rapid diagnostic tests and also treating malaria in the villages. 
And so being in touch with those ashas, being able to guide them, mentor them, answer their questions, uh, and uh, continuously build their capacity will, will help. But we can also use these tools to reach people. We know now that uh, using social media, using uh, mobile messaging and so on, you can also reach out uh, to people. The third area I think that we can leverage and where we've learned lessons is on how to do research rapidly um, uh, on new drugs, on new vaccines. We, it doesn't have to take 10 years and 15 years you know, to do these studies. So if we work in a joined up manner, uh, along with the regulatory system, along with the clinical research sites, uh, the ethics committees and the communities, then we can, uh, I think, uh, fast track some of the research that is needed to, to answer some of the uh, emerging questions. A very important point, especially on both the manpower, the surveillance, the research, very important areas actually. Doctor, this now increasingly, when you, when you talk to experts, most of them nowadays talk about the newer technologies which are now being discussed. Whether it's the use of Wolbachia bacteria or whether it is gene editing uh, or whether even the newer vaccines, where do you think we stand in terms of the wider availability or access to this and what could India leverage in this? So you mentioned Wolbachia. That's been uh, actually trials have shown it to be very effective in dengue. So that, of course, is a different species of mosquito. But if you use Wolbachia as basically a, a bacterium that uh, can be used to infect those mosquitoes and then they it prevents them from carrying the dengue parasite. It's not being tried yet for malaria but there may be similar approaches. Similarly, gene editing uh, is also undergoing some field trials now. It's still, it has a lot of uh, ethical and regulatory issues. So it has to be looked at very, very closely because you're manipulating the genetics of, of the mosquito and the gene drive technology actually, once you introduce it into the population, it is self-perpetuating. And, um, and therefore one needs to study it carefully in clinical trials. And WHO has not yet got enough evidence to make recommendations to use that. So in the meantime, I think we have to uh, use the tried and tested uh, methods, both on vector control, as well as on patient management. On vaccines, uh, the mRNA technology obviously offers us a lot of uh, potential, but again, that potential has to be tried. Companies must develop malaria vaccine, and we're very happy that uh, BioNTech, which developed a successful COVID vaccine based on mRNA platform, has announced that they will work uh, along with uh, collaborators in Africa to develop a malaria vaccine. So I think using some of these new platform technologies, Indian companies should also work on developing novel malaria vaccines. So far, only one vaccine, RTSS, has been given a WHO policy recommendation. And it is mainly to be used in areas of high falciparum prevalence, where a lot of young children and babies die of falciparum malaria mainly sub-Saharan Africa is where it's going to be introduced. We don't have good vaccines for plasmodium vivax, which is a big problem in India and Southeast Asia. So a lot of research is still needed. Yeah, for this research, for this vaccine, actually, I think the Indian company, Bharat Biotech, I think has the technology transform from GSK. Yeah. The yes. so that's, but again, we need India specifically. So finally, Dr. Last point about... If you were to look in terms of the key priorities at the moment for India in its journey, so to say, till 2030, if not earlier, hopefully, uh, what would be the two or three points which you think, you know, you've referred to, of course, you've said on manpower, you've said on surveillance, and you've said on the research as well. But if you were to point out two, three things which on an immediate basis could be first attended to in, our, in this journey. So first of all, uh, let me say that we need to look within India at good examples and best practices that have been proven to be very successful. And I want to mention two. One is Odisha state as a whole, which took up the challenge because, you know, they had the highest prevalence of malaria because of a lot of forested and tribal areas that, uh, as you know, malaria is concentrated in the central Indian tribal districts. So the state was able to really show that uh, there can be uh, a significant reduction in malaria uh, incidence by a comprehensive approach. And similarly, in Madhya Pradesh, in Mandla district, there was a public-private partnership project that uh, ran for over four years, which showed 
that by doing a combination of both good vector control, um, training of the community uh, level field workers, providing them with rapid diagnostic tests so that everybody who can be tested, who has any kind of uh, symptoms of uh, malaria, immediate treatment to be provided, health education, and uh, good monitoring, good monitoring and surveillance. When you have a comprehensive package like that, they actually brought down, I think it was done in about 100 villages in Mandla district, significant reduction in malaria over the period of the intervention. So I think we can learn from some of these projects that in the Indian con context have shown success. What does it need? It basically needs investment in human resources. You know, without manpower, I think no amount of technology is going to solve our problems. So you need manpower trained and uh, equipped with whatever they need. And they have to be well compensated for the job that they are doing. They have to be kept motivated. They have to be monitored. They have to be trained. So a big emphasis on human resources. And, you know, we don't need parallel uh, workforce for each disease. You have the same workforce, but then you utilize them for malaria and the malaria season. And they may be also utilized for some of the other vector-borne diseases. I also mentioned strengthening of field epidemiology, field public health vector control uh, entomologists. So the pandemic, I think, has taught us that the, the capacity at the lowest level of healthcare delivery, the primary healthcare level and below that is absolutely critical. So we need to relook at whether we have adequate human resources or not and then invest in that. And that obviously also means that you have to put in more of financial resources. I think second thing is surveillance. I think we talked about integrated surveillance, including genomic surveillance. The third is we've seen how investments in research and development pay off. And therefore, we need to invest in uh, innovative tools that are needed for our own diseases and our own problems. And I know that when I was in ICMR, we you know, have run many such trials for filariasis, for Kalazar, visceral leishmaniasis. And India has done well, actually, in many of these uh, diseases. So constant research, constant uh, evaluation. Uh, as I mentioned, the drugs, new drugs come. Now we have single dose treatment for pediatric malaria using a drug called tefenoquine. So we need to see where the new innovations can be introduced and how they can be monitored. Um, and then finally, of course, the community engagement uh, is most important, I would say. Unless communities where malaria is a big problem are involved, are engaged, and um, understand you know, the interventions, which again need to be pack, pack, part of a comprehensive health package. Sometimes communities become quite, uh, I would say, even reluctant to accept interventions if they are only narrowly targeted and focused on one disease rather than addressing their overall health problems. And I've seen this myself with tuberculosis or with nutrition. People need health care for their problems. And so I think Delivery of malaria intervention has to be seen as part of a comprehensive delivery of primary health care services. That is, the, I think, the vision of Ayushman Bharat. And um, uh, we should be able to, to get there because there is the vision, there is the high-level political commitment. What it will need is sustained investment and resources both in the public health aspects and also in the research aspects. Actually, and I think other than community, which you mentioned also, the many private foundations, private sector foundations also have been collaborating in many of the pockets. And actually, I think... That Absolutely, and, yes. Uh, so philanthropic know. organizations also play an important role, NGOs and civil society organizations. Last as a footnote, after another eight years, you think this seems realistic now, elimination of malaria in Indian context, or are we still... It can be done. Southeast Asia region, I think, should be able to eliminate malaria by 2030, which is what uh, the ministers of the region have committed to. That's a very nice note to end on. Thank you so much, Doctor. It's been incredible listening and hopefully I think many will gain from your thoughts. Thanks so much, Doctor. Thank you very much.